Russia puts Starlink on killer drones. The war just reached the stars, and the battlefield is about to change forever. And that, right there, was the headline that just, it dropped this Monday, December 22, 2025. And it has completely uh, upended the entire geopolitical playbook. It's a shocking development, truly. It is. We are watching this, this terrifying paradox play out in real mm -hmm. time. The very best cutting-edge Western satellite tech Starlink, mm -hmm. which has been you know, absolutely essential for Ukraine's defense, mm -hmm. is now being repurposed is being integrated and weaponized to power Moscow's most advanced long-range surveillance. Hmm. The gravity of this, I mean, it demands informed analysis. When the conflict takes a leap this big, understanding what's actually happening is uh, critical. If you believe in supporting those fighting for their freedom, if you support Ukraine in this conflict, now is the moment to follow or subscribe. Yeah. But just hold on, because this isn't just a satellite dish slapped onto a wing, not even close. We are going to expose the exact and frankly bizarre list of parts inside this new terror weapon. It's quite the list. It's unbelievable. We're talking about a microcomputer you could use for home project, a Chinese mini PC running a licensed copy of Windows 11, and yes, a Starlink terminal. Stay with us as we unpack how all these civilian parts are suddenly defining the future of aerial reconnaissance. Okay, let's get into it. This unbelievable development was first reported by the Defense Intelligence of Ukraine, the HUR. Right. And they're the ones on the ground analyzing captured enemy tech. They're the definitive authority here, really. So our mission is clear. We need to cut through the shock and figure out exactly what the Molnia 2R is and why... Uh, why this Starlink integration just fundamentally changes the game. Well, what's fascinating here is just how quickly they've iterated. I mean, they went from a disposable weapon to a pretty sophisticated intelligence platform. So where did it start? The original Molni was incredibly simple. It was basically an aircraft type uh, first person view FTV kamikaze drone. OK, a one way trip. Exactly. A one way trip. It had one mission, launch from a catapult, get guided by an operator and hit a target. It was designed to be cheap, effective and completely sacrificial. Like a guided missile, but a drone. Low endurance, high impact. Precisely. Okay. But they clearly needed more. That led to the Molnia 2. This was the first major physical overhaul. They added two pretty robust engines on the wings. Which would require a whole new body. A completely redesigned fuselage, yeah, mm. for stability, for endurance. And crucially, this gave it a significantly increased flight range, and they paired that with a reinforced warhead. So it's moving from a close-range suicide mission to something that could, you know, deliver a heavier punch much further away. Exactly. But it was still, at its core, disposable. And now we get to the platform that HUR just analyzed, the Molnia 2R, that R signals the massive strategic pivot. R for reconnaissance. Exactly. This latest version is designed specifically for a long-term aerial reconnaissance, not a suicide attack. The need for persistence, for, you know, continuous eyes on target, and for real-time target correction. That's what drove the need for reliable, high-bandwidth communication. And that's where Starlink comes in. That is precisely why they bolted on Starlink. This shift from kamikaze to reconnaissance shows a strategic need for continuous intelligence gathering over huge areas. And this is where the details go from tactical to just <laughs> utterly shocking. When the HUR experts cracked this thing open, the components inside looked less like advanced defense hardware and more like a trip to, I don't know, a local electronics store. That paradox is the entire story of modern conflict. Mm -hmm. We're talking about two main computers driving this system. You mentioned the first one, the Raspberry Pi 5. The Raspberry Pi. I mean, people use those to build retro game consoles. They do. It's a sub hundred dollar device. But look at what they're leveraging. The Pi 5 isn't just cheap. It's a highly capable quad core processor with excellent uh, I.O. capabilities. Meaning it's good at talking to all the other parts of the drone. Very good. It's small, it's lightweight, energy efficient, and you can get them anywhere. They are likely using it as the central flight controller or maybe to manage video compression before it gets sent up to the satellite. So they're choosing speed and availability over, you know, custom military grade hardware. It's a calculated choice. It bypasses the enormous lead time and cost of manufacturing custom tech. OK, that's one computer. And then there's the second one, which brings in a whole different level of crazy, right? Absolutely. The secondary computer is a Chinese mini PC F8. They try to disguise it under the Russian Ruscot brand name, but, you know, the origin is clear. And the kicker. The geopolitical kicker is that this Chinese mini PC is running a licensed Windows 11 operating system. Hold on. Licensed Windows 11. They are guiding a military recon drone with the same software I use to check my email. That seems insane. 
from a security standpoint. It does. I mean, you'd think they would use a hardened custom Linux build or something similar. Right. So why risk it? That's the strategic question. A custom OS is more secure, sure, but the immediate need is functionality and speed. Using Windows 11, even if they get it through uh, illicit channels, lets them rapidly integrate commercial off-the-shelf software drivers, visual interfaces. It speeds everything up. So it's a huge risk, but the speed of integration is what matters most to them. It's the overriding factor, and it really exposes the, um, the massive challenge of enforcing sanctions on software that's just universally available. So they have this bizarre brain. Now let's talk about the eyes. For a recon mission, high quality stable vision is everything. It's the whole point. The Molnia 2R has two camera systems. You've got your standard FTV camera for basic orientation for the pilot. But the critical piece for intelligence gathering is the second one, a Chinese SIYI ZR10 camera. And what makes that particular camera so crucial? Its specs are, well, transformative for this drone's role. Yeah. It features a 10x optical zoom, which lets the operator spot targets from much higher, safer altitudes. That makes the drone way harder to see or shoot down. But the real game changer is the three-axis stabilization. Okay, why is that so important for reconnaissance? Well, imagine you're trying to film something from a tiny, vibrating drone flying miles away. Without stabilization, the video is just a useless, shaky mess. Right, you can't make anything out. Three-axis stabilization takes all that movement out. It gives you a clear, sharp, steady image. And that sharp, stable intelligence lets you do precise measurement, identification, and most importantly, accurate target correction for artillery or other strikes. So the Molni 2R isn't just taking fuzzy pictures anymore. It's collecting high-def, actionable intelligence. That's the leap they've made. So we have this sophisticated, stable platform built from, from repurposed civilian tech. But like you said, all that visual data, the 10x zoom video, the telemetry, it's all useless if you can't send it back reliably. And this brings us back to that bombshell from Monday, December 22nd, the Starlink integration. That is the entire strategic calculation. The main function of that Starlink terminal on the drone is to create a robust, high bandwidth connection that just eliminates the traditional limits of military communications. This isn't just a small bump in range. Though. No, no. This is a total transformation of its operational reach. Think about the amount of data they need to transmit all at once. It must be huge. They're routing three critical streams through Starlink. First, the high-res video from both cameras, the FPV, and that detailed SIYI ZR10, that alone needs massive bandwidth. Second, continuous telemetry data, you know, the drone's health, its exact location, fuel. And third, the critical low latency control commands from the operator back to the drone. So it's the difference between sending a crackly radio signal and having a dedicated high-speed internet pipe straight to the drone no matter where it is. That's a great way to put it. And, you know, it addresses the risk question. Why rely on a Western system? Because Starlink is so resilient. It uses a massive dispersed satellite constellation. It's much, much harder to jam than a fixed frequency radio link. And the strategic implication of that is just enormous. It's huge. The Molina 2R can now operate far beyond the front lines. It drastically increases the persistence and the reach of their aerial reconnaissance and target correction. The battle space just ex it expands exponentially when you plug in commercial space communication. This entire development, this drone running Windows 11 powered by a Raspberry Pi communicating via Starlink, mm. It feels like a microcosm of this whole conflict's reliance on global supply chains. It really is. And this isn't an isolated case. We connect this drone to the bigger picture. This pattern is everywhere. You mean other weapon systems? Yes. HWAR's previous intelligence work has been crucial in showing this dependency. They previously revealed the component base inside the Iranian Shahid 107 turbojet drone. Right. And those findings were just as astonishing. They showed parts sourced from all over the world. It wasn't just uh, Chinese components. Not at all. The Shahid had parts from the U.S., China, Switzerland, other major manufacturing hubs. And they found 68 new foreign components in Russian missiles and other drones used in attacks on critical infrastructure. It just highlights this massive, maybe insurmountable challenge for sanctions enforcement. It's a logistical nightmare to restrict these things. Yeah. The sheer volume and low cost of these dual-use civilian parts, they move through these complex supply chains with shell companies because the parts themselves are just basic microprocessors, cameras, GPS modules. The same stuff used in millions of commercial products. Exactly. The Malnaya 2R just reinforces this new reality. Even advanced military systems are now built on a global civilian tech foundation, and that allows for extremely rapid, cost-effective 
effective and sophisticated adaptation. So as we're looking at the conflict moving forward this week, starting on Monday, December 22, 2025, what does this all mean for us? The core insight here is that the Molniya Tuar is the perfect manifestation of modern hybrid warfare. They've just they cannibalized global civilian tech uh, Raspberry Pi, Windows 11, the resilience of Starlink to achieve a long-range recon capability that traditional military systems would take years and billions of dollars to build. They're trading security for speed. Immediate operational speed. That's the trade-off. And it leaves us with an absolutely terrifying question for the future. If commercial satellite infrastructure like Starlink can be so quickly repurposed to extend the reach of an adversarial military force, not by the satellite operator, but by the enemy, what does this imply for the security and integrity of all commercial space infrastructure? As the battlefield moves into orbit, who really controls the connectivity? Something for you to consider. You've been listening to J&J's Military Report, where we analyze the latest in military strategy, global defense, and advanced weaponry. We'll catch you next time.